Hi, everyone. Michael Britt here. Now, I'm very proud that the Psych Files podcast has been so successful. It passed the 20 million download mark. And a lot of that success is due to my episodes on how you can use proven memory strategies to remember just about anything, from memorizing terms for a test to remembering people's names at a party or a meeting, or even memorizing speeches. It's amazing how useful these strategies are. So, I put all of these episodes into one audio course. The course is called Hippos, Aliens, and Llamas Quickly Master the Tricks to a Great Memory. And it's available now on avid.fm slash memorymaster. All one word. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 298 of The Psych Files. Professor Michael Britt here, and today we're going to talk about your health, or how we can get you to be healthier. And we're going to do that by nudging you, not by lecturing you about the importance of health, exercise, and diet. But we're going to going to go over a few pieces of research that I think you'll find really interesting, give you a couple of ideas as to why maybe you're not eating or exercising as much as you should, and what you might be able to do to change that. All right, so how are we going to get you to eat right and exercise. Now, I've talked about this in a few episodes, uh, actually, a few back, and I, so I'll put them under if, if in the show notes for this episode. Talked about it back in episode 167 called The Fat Trap, How Not to Get Discouraged About the Difficulty of Losing Weight. Even did an episode on uh, psychoanalyzing someone who's famous but maybe less remembered these days. That's Jack LaLanne. That was a fun episode to do. And episode 57, so it goes really pretty far back. I talked about expectancy theory, goal setting, and getting in shape. So what's new? Well, my story begins back way back in graduate school. Now, one of the things I wanted to do was to study motivation. Very broad topic, but uh, you know, it kind of includes a whole bunch of theories. Typically, when we think about motivation. We think of a good old uh, Maslow, but that's just like one. He's very memorable and been around for a long time. But in previous episodes, I've talked about goal setting and I've talked about a little bit about expectancy, which I want to talk about again. And if you're into this area, you'll want to check into self-determination theory. So uh, in this, as I say, in this episode, I'll have links to all of those previous episodes. Okay. So uh, in addition to Milgram, the theory that really caught my eye during most of my graduate work was was expectancy theory, although this particular one, because there's a lot of theories that kind of lump themselves under expectancy, uh, this one was put together by Victor Vroom, easy name to remember, V-R-O-O-M, and this was back in the 60s, and it's really, a, I loved the, at first, the simplicity of his model, and then became frustrated because it didn't always work, but it seemed like it should. So very briefly, Victor Vroom's theory, sometimes called VIE theory, because there's just three components to it. Uh, V, obviously, valence, instrumentality, and expectancy. And already it sounds complicated, but best explained, I think, when you just think about an example. Suppose you say, well, I want to get in shape. All right, so that's your end goal, right? You want to, uh, let's say we want to make that more specific, which is always good. What what exactly is getting in shape? So you say, all right, well, um, I ask you to be more specific and set yourself a good hard goal. And so you say, all right, well, I want to lose 20 pounds in the next uh, four months. First, you want to think about that a little bit. So that means five pounds a, a month. That's a little bit aggressive. I guess not too bad. It's all right. It's a good start. So um, So we'll go with that. So now at least we have a specific goal. And so valence, that, that V in Vroom's theory, is about sort of how much do you want that? Two people could say, look, I want to lose 20 pounds in five months, but one person really wants it badly, and another person is like, yeah, I, I, I think I would like that. That would be good. So the strength of your valence is one of the most important indicators of whether or not you actually will do what you just said you wanted to do. And so we often ask people in this model, we'll ask them to pick a number as we always do, it seems like in psychology, between 1 and 10. Because we want to be able to predict whether or not you'll actually go for this goal. So if you pick a 10, okay, then you are probably more likely, at least the theory goes, to hit that goal, 
get that 20 pound loss than someone who says, well, I mean, I want it. Um, how much do I want it? I mean, you know, it was seven, I guess. Okay. So those two people ought to behave differently. The second guy may, may not. Sounds like he will. It's hard to be sure. Okay. But there's more to it than that. And though that's the starting place. Because there's the E in Vroom's theory, expectancy. So in other words, um, after you make this decision, you're going to lose five pounds in four, four months, you have to either figure it out yourself or ask someone, maybe you get a personal trainer or something, or, or a nutritionist, or maybe you just try and do this yourself with a bunch of reading online. And so you decide that, well, what you're going to have to do, and you'll probably come up with something like this, is to exercise four days a week. And you're going to also have to eat smaller portion sizes and eat more fruits and vegetables. Okay, so let's just go with that because this is, I think, I mean, I think that's fine advice. I mean, I've been trying to follow that, but this is not a show on, on health, but I think that's a good starting point. So expectancy. Now, this is the extent to which you think you can do what I just described. If two people are given that same advice or find that out online that they have to work out, uh, five days a week, each day for, what did I say, no, four days a week, each time for an hour. And it has to be fairly vigorous, right? You can't just walk kind of nonchalantly on the treadmill. you got to really give it a try here. Maybe you also have to do little resistance exercises in addition to aerobic. And so there's that piece. And then there's the eating the smaller portions at uh, your dinner and eating more fruits and vegetables. I mean, it's starting to, it's, it's, a, it's a goodly bit of work. So expectancy is the extent to which you think you can do those things. And again, if we have two different people and I say to two different people, okay, look, you want to lose the 20 pounds. That's great. Now, in order to do that, you're going to have to work out four days a week for an hour at a time and decrease your portion size and eat more fruits and vegetables. And again, one person may say, I'm in. I'm a 10 on that. I, I, I can do that. I expect I can. And the other person, let's say, is a little, you know, like, well, I don't know, man, working out uh, four days a week for an hour to, Oh, uh, geez, that's it's going to be kind of tough. Um, I mean, I, I guess. Uh, all right, I'll give it another seven. Okay, okay. There's one final component to it, though, before we just state, okay, the one guy with the tens is going to lose the weight, and the other guy with the sevens is maybe, I don't know. And the last component is instrumentality. Now, this is the tricky one, but it's the final piece, and it really has to do with the extent to which you think that if you do the things I just told you you have to do, that doing those things will definitely lead to the lost weight. And we, we tend to differ on this one. In other words, some people would listen to that advice and say, that's a good plan. Now, do I think that if I do that, it'll be instrumental in getting to my weight loss? If you think that's a good plan you, and you give that a 10, then you're ready to go. I mean, it sounds to me like you're, you've got everything all lined up. You, you think you can do what I've just described. You think that if you do it, you'll definitely get to the end goal and you really want the end goal. You're 10 times 10 times 10. And we have a hypothetical other guy who says, well, you know, I mean, I know that working out and eating good, I mean, that should help me to lose weight, but you know, I don't know. I've tried before. I just don't know if I can stick to it. Plus, I think weight has a lot to do with genetics. I mean, you can work out and some people don't have to work out and they, they're already. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, do I think your plan works? I guess, you know, I suppose. I mean, I'll give it a seven. <laughs> so we'll keep that guy on sevens. Okay, so that's basically it. Although what's interesting about Vroom's theory is that he did actually have a little formula saying that the force of your motivation can, in fact, be calculated by multiplying V times I times E. So 10 times 10 is 100 times 10 is 1,000. So you know, we get that number. And the other guy is 7 times 7 is 49. And uh, 49 times 7 is, uh, well, let's see. I know what I'm going to ask. Siri, how much is 49 times 7? 49 times 7 is 343. Okay, 343. Sounds like he's got about a third of what the other guy's got. So this theory should work. And, and as I say, I mean, if you think about it, it's, you know, it makes a lot of sense. The problem is it just didn't work out that well. 
tons of research was done on this VIE theory, and it was not so good. This was sort of born at a time, there are a lot of books out now, maybe the first one uh, came out a few years ago, which I think I've talked about also on this podcast, and that was called Nudge. Thayer, I think, is the author there, uh, T-H-A-Y-E-R. And it's about how we change behavior through small changes in the environment. And this that's the way we think today because we used to think that human beings were pretty rational. I mean, it absolutely makes sense. If you are, in fact, a rational person, then this theory should work. I mean, it should really have high correlations with the outcome, whether or not you lose weight. Uh, the other big book in this area is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. He did a lot of research with Amos Tversky. Essential names for you to know if you're studying psychology. Kahneman and Tversky. Thinking Fast and Slow is a great book. Came out a few years ago. Big book, but lots of fun. A very interesting book. So what, what did researchers do when they found out that they measured these three things and it just kept not working out so well? It seems that no matter how much you might want something, it, well, it doesn't always, always correlate with whether you work hard to get it. Your best intentions very, very often don't lead to you attaining the goals that you set. And so the theory went from three pieces to even more pieces to different calculations uh, of motivational force. Uh, maybe we don't multiply all, maybe we add these two and multiply by that one. So there was all kinds of somewhat interesting mathematics that went on and then new pieces were added to the theory until finally I saw a chart. If the original theory started out with three arrows, actually, no, that'd be two arrows, the last one I saw must have had over 20 with all these what they call mediating factors. And they did research on these more expanded models, and they still didn't come out right. And so what Kahneman and Tversky's work, essentially what they finally decided was, look, uh, people are not rational. In fact, there was a book, Dan Aieli, hope I pronounced that right, Dan Aieli, called Predictably Irrational and uh, the hidden forces that shape our decisions. What's interesting is that a lot of this comes from economists, because economists are interested in why we make the decisions that we do. Why do we buy this product instead of that product? So as a psychologist, I would say the reason why the theory doesn't work, even though a lot of it makes sense, is that there are unconscious influences on our behavior, right? We're going back uh, to, uh, well, we could certainly trace it back to Freud or before that. Why don't you lose weight? Well, maybe maybe there are some unresolved issues that you're dealing with. You may say you want to lose weight, but you actually don't. You have a lot of anger or maybe sadness. And these things make it very difficult for you to stick long-term to a reasonable health maintenance program. And so... Despite what your cognitions are, your behavior is just determined by so many different things inside you that are unique to you. So you can buy a bunch of different exercise books and all that. I'm sure many of them have great advice, but none of them know you. We don't know what your life situation is. How are you dealing with your job situation or your family situation? How do you deal with stress what are some typical ways that you express your anger, I mean, or your sadness, or your anxiety? But a typical health book is not going to go into, well, how do you deal with anxiety? I mean, maybe little bits here and there. So we're still at a point in psychology where we've got some great theories. They take us a certain amount, certain distance, and then there's this valley uh, of our unconscious. So we can only predict so much, really not that much. The rest of it might be, a lot of it could be unconscious. So what do we do? I guess we should just give up. (laughs) Let's just forget about trying to predict your behavior and, and measuring your motivations because there's just too many unconscious factors. Well, we could do that, but that's not any fun. So along comes these books that I've just mentioned here, you know, predictably irrational, thinking fast and slow, which pretty much say, yeah, okay, what do we do? Since you're irrational, and since there are all these unconscious factors that we have no control over, do we give up or can we 
get you to make the right decisions in some other way. If your cognitions are only a, a little bit of the issue and your unconscious is another part of the issue, well, what's left? And what's left is the environment. And so, as I mentioned before, what these books are about is how can we adjust your environment to nudge you towards the end goal that you say you want. Now, you probably already do some of this. For example, instead of putting a bag of chips in front of you, you pour the chips into a bowl. I mean, if you're going to eat the chips, pour the chips into a bowl and just eat what's in the bowl and make sure that the bowl is reasonably sized, not a huge bowl. That is your way of sort of nudging yourself towards health. Because we all know that if you just keep the bag there, you're just going to keep eating, right? So there, those are the little things. And I'll bet you have other kinds of things that you do to um, make sure that you nudge yourself in the right direction. Not having chips at all in the house actually would be one of those things. Having apples in the refrigerator and having them near the front uh, would be another way to nudge you towards healthy eating. We all know that store grocery stores have candy in the front and that's to kind of get you kind of tap into your impulsive self and get you to buy those things but there are grade schools and high school cafeterias where what you find at the front or near the very end of your purchase is fruit and vegetables and that's one way to nudge students towards better health now this approach is not without some controversy For example, some years ago, the mayor of New York City wanted to pass a law that prevented convenience stores from selling, I think it was either 24-ounce or maybe it was 32-ounce sodas. Now, that's a lot of soda, and it isn't very healthy for you to eat that or drink that. Very controversial because what happens is reactance kicks in. We don't like to be told what, uh, or we don't like to be restricted. We want a lot of choice. Even though, as we know, having a lot of choice is actually not really that good thing. I talked about that in a previous episode. But we do like to feel that we have control of our own lives. So people reacted by saying, look, you know, who is the government to tell me what I can and cannot drink? Or how big a size a drink I can have? I don't want to be controlled by the government. So it it didn't work. You know, the answer I would have to that, uh, if, if I may, is that... The food companies employ researchers to figure out how to make their food products as addictive as possible. And so I recommend a book called Sugar, Salt, Fat. I might as well just look that up, make sure I have. Okay, yep, here it is. It's called, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's called Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us came out in 2014 by Michael Moss. So I'll link to that from the website. Great book, Salt, Sugar, Fat. And it basically talks about the people who are employed full-time to alter those ingredients, as well as a few other things like mouthfeel, which is crunchiness. I mean, they look at everything. Everything is, is manipulated through careful scientific study to get you to eat foods which probably aren't so good for you in most cases. So you may say, look, I want to control. I don't want anybody controlling me. Well, you know, you've got companies that are doing things to manipulate you in any case. All right. So there's controversy there in terms of how much of a nudge can we give you without you getting too upset about a perception that we're taking away your freedom. Well, one of the nudges that I talked about in a few, quite a few episodes back was an idea, I think was just a great idea, which was, how do we get drivers to slow down? All right. Well, our typical approach to getting you to change your speeding behavior is to put up signs and to inform you as to the speeding limit. And we can send you to classes uh, in which we uh, teach you how going a little bit above the speed limit actually doesn't get you where you want to go any faster. So we can approach this problem of speeding with information, and we can lecture you uh, about the, the ills and the dangers of speeding. And, well, it doesn't work so well. How about this approach instead? We want to get you to slow down. So we put lines in the middle of the road that you're used to, but 
when we get to a turn that's particularly dangerous and where we want you to really slow down, we make the lines shorter, which gives you the impression that you are going really fast. And so you compensate by slowing down to the speed we want you to be at when you take the turn. Would you call that manipulating? We have gotten you to do what we want, not through lectures that you've already forgotten that you took years ago, the speeding signs, which you ignore. We've done it by, well, a gentle persuasion, shall we call it. But it's a pretty cool idea, and it works. All right, how do we do this in the health area? Okay, so what is the research? How can we nudge you towards better health? Well, the first article is really great. It's called, uh, it's more of a summary. It's called Judging Nudging, colon, Can Nudging Improve Population Health? And I'll have a link to the article, but you can check them out at bmj.com. And this article was written by Teresa Marteau. Now, she talks about another way to get you towards health, which is social norm feedback. One way to get you to change your eating and exercise is to, well, can I use the word manipulate? Kind of. Manipulate your frame of reference. In other words, manipulate what you think other people are doing because we are strongly motivated to do what other people are doing. Now, here's a very broad-based way to get you to be more active, and that is to design your whole community not around roads, but actually make driving around your area difficult and make sidewalks the more obvious way, maybe the only way, for you to get around. So can you imagine that? Now, here's an attempt, not at the individual label, to educate you or try to motivate you to do the right thing. Some years ago, the main street, and uh, not too far from here, but actually it was in the town that I lived in, the whole main street was paved over, and it was uh, replaced with bricks, and it, you had to walk to the stores on main street. You couldn't drive and park. The story is it didn't really last that long and eventually was paved over. <laughs> so I guess it didn't work. But the, uh, it was a lofty notion. Now, here's an interesting approach. For example, one thing we could do if you go to a store, uh, if you go to some um, fast food restaurants you may have known, may have noticed that you can get as a side to your meal, chips or an apple. <laughs> and of course, most of us choose chips. But what if the apple is simply given to you and you weren't given a choice about chips? Hmm, that might be one way to get you to eat apples. The problem, but it doesn't always work. Here's an interesting quote from this article. Making healthier side dishes the default can lead to a halo effect, resulting in an underestimation of the energy content and consequently, I won't go into all of this, let me, let me tell you the study because this is more interesting. In one study, participants estimated that a hamburger contained 697 calories when it was presented alone, but they estimated that, that it contained 642 calories when it was presented with three celery sticks. Hey Siri, how much is 697 minus 642? 697 minus 642 is 55. <laughs> okay. Boy, I'm telling you, these, uh, these virtual assistants really do come in handy. Uh, so 55. So you, people estimated that, that if you surround a food with healthy stuff, people think the food doesn't have that many cal as many calories. And I'll bet you've done this to yourself. You eat something healthy for lunch, and then you feel you can have something not so healthy in the afternoon. So um, that might backfire on you. Essentially, the upshot of this first paper is that, yes, these sorts of nudges can work. We just have to be careful that they can backfire. All right, so here's another piece of research. This came out of the American Marketing Association, and it's called The Unhealthy Equals tasty intuition and its effects on taste inferences, enjoyment, and choice of food products. Now, this has to do with our notion that unhealthy foods are tasty and healthy foods are not. Now, of course, I guess there's a good deal of truth to this. Uh, broccoli uh, may not be the tastiest thing. It all depends on how you prepare it. But cake and cookies, because of the sugar content and all that, are tasty. The problem comes when we extend this to all foods. I mean, how, how can we, is every healthy food tasteless? 
how can we get you to eat healthy foods if you're sort of stuck in this perception that healthy stuff is like uh, you know, like bark on a tree, <laughs> right? We've heard that one before as well. Okay, so they did an interesting study. And I'm just going to quote from this. 110 undergraduate students took part in an experiment for course credit. So they were told that the purpose of the experiment, quote, was to assess consumers' taste perceptions of three new brands of cheddar-flavored snack crackers. And uh, to lend credibility... To the story, the participants were told that a national cracker manufacturer was interested in introducing these brands of crackers into the local market. <laughs> okay, so you're there to taste crackers. Quote, before seeing the nutritional information for each cracker, participants were presented with the following information about the characteristics of bad and good saturated fat. So, some groups heard this. Medical opinion suggests that consuming unsaturated fat or good fat, can raise the level of high-density lipoproteins, which carry cholesterol from the heart to the liver and thereby eliminate excess cholesterol. So they're given a little information about good fats and bad fats. So one brand of cracker was portrayed as containing 11 grams of good fat and only 2 grams of bad fat. Another brand of cracker was portrayed as containing two gra only 2 grams of good fat and 11 grams of bad fat. So you're given crackers, and it's the same cracker, but you're led to believe that one of the crackers contains more bad fat. And then you're asked, how tasty do you think the cracker would be? And how much do you think you would enjoy eating them? Again, a 10-point scale. Not at all. 10, very much. And guess what? If you thought the cracker contained more bad fat, you tended to think it was tastier. The average there is 7.3. And for the cracker that you think has a low amount of bad fat, the mean was around 5. So that's a, that's a all right, it's a difference. So uh, we expect tasty foods to be bad for you. Now here's another study in here that I, that I think is lots of fun. <laughs> This one, uh, I just got to quote this one because it's so unique. Forty adults were invited to a housewarming party at the residence of one of the authors of the article, and they were told that refreshments would be served. The refreshment item that they served was called mango lassi, L-A-S-S-I, which they say is an East Indian delicacy similar to a milkshake. And this part's fun. To, quote, lend further credibility to our cover story, a confederate, who is actually a graduate student of East Indian origin, was hired to play the role of an agent representing a restaurant. And this person handed out a one-page questionnaire asking participants' judgments of the tastiness of the drink. For about half of these participants, this mango lassie was portrayed as a healthy item, made of real mango pulp and milk, generally considered very healthy. And for the other half, the mango lassie was portrayed as an unhealthy choice. Quote, made of real mango pulp and milk, generally considered unhealthy. So I guess one way to do that is just to come out and say uh, it's unhealthy. And guess what? When you introduce the mango lassie milkshake as healthy, it's not seen as so tasty. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, you know, the problem is, is, as I said before, that healthy foods are often not so tasty. I mean, like broccoli, right? spinach. Now, where'd you get that from? <laughs> Where, where'd you get that notion from that, that healthy foods are not, uh, not tasty? Well, you would say, because I tasted them. Okay, there you go again. There's another way that you have acquired this perception that healthy foods are not tasty, and that is by the way they are described on the menu, or shall I say, the words that surround the descriptions of healthy and unhealthy food. A research article that appeared in, let's see, this was the Health Psychology Journal, and it's called Reading Between the Menu Lines. Are restaurants' descriptions of healthy foods unappealing? Now think about it, and check this out. Next time you're going around you know, at a restaurant and stuff, take a look at how healthy foods are described. What these researchers did is they, quote, they went to menus collected from 100 top-selling chain restaurants 
in the casual slash family dining category. These 26 menus contain 262 healthy menu items with 5,873 words and 2,286 standard menu items with 38,343 words. These people are serious about their work. All right, so they're looking at the words that describe the foods. And by the way, the the healthy foods they're referring to are seafood, chicken, uh, salads, steak, sandwiches, soups. And what they found, as you might be not too surprised, is that the descriptions of these foods you, foods used significantly fewer exciting, fun, traditional, American regional, texture, provocative, spicy, hot, artisanal, tasty, and indulgent words than did standard menu items. Uh, healthy items tended to use words that were like fresh, simple, macronutrient, and that sounded delicious, thinness, and nutritious words. So a couple more of these words that surround unhealthy food. The word crazy, spellbinding, action, adventure, blasts, <laughs> word blast, yeah, like a flavor blast. It's fun, it's dippable, it's flaky, it's gooey, it's velvety. Oh, I love these words, they make me hungry already. It's fiery. It's got you. It's fire cracking. It's flavorful. <laughs> okay. How about for our healthy foods? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, fresh, uh, simple, simple. Wow, terrible word. That is dry, mild, plain. Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Whole wheat. Uh, it's light. It's enlightened. Oh, the food is enlightened. It's skinny licious. <laughs> oh, God. Fat free, sugar free. Nutritional. Okay, so uh, I guess what we need to do is we need to describe healthy foods using these luscious words. Of course, you don't want to lie. Can't quite say that broccoli is velvety. (laughs) But I guess you could. You know, it depends upon how you... you, If you prepare the broccoli uh, correctly, you could use the word decadent, rich, indulge, bliss... Why couldn't those go along with uh, broccoli? Crispy? Hmm? Sinful? Well, I guess you could do that. I don't know about blasts. <laughs> I don't know if broccoli... Can you prepare broccoli so that it really gives you a mouth blast? I don't know. Maybe. Spellbinding? Crazy? I don't know. You could. Maybe one way to change our eating habits is this. But difficult. But let's not give up. Okay, that's the episode for today. Go out and nudge yourself to live a healthy life. All right. Have some fun. See you in the next episode. Take care. Bye now. One last thing. Remember to check out my memory course. You can use these strategies to get better grades on your tests, to remember people's names, and even help you to remember those jokes you keep forgetting. So you will be amazed. Avid.fm slash memory master. That's avid, A-V-I-D dot F-M slash memory master. Thanks.